Thank you very much, Chairman, for those very kind words of introduction, and thank you all for being here this evening. I particularly want to express my appreciation to the sponsors, uh, the Tomasek International Foundation, as well as NTU and Hong Kong Baptist University for all the efforts in putting this together. I won't go into a detailed listing of the various people who have been helping uh, me out uh, in, in making my participation possible. Uh, I have a, a fairly uh, long slideshow, but the intention really is to uh, try to demystify and familiarize you with many terms which you might find uh, or come across in the uh, inequality discourse. Um, as Sharon emphasized quite correctly, uh, inequality is now a subject uh, which is considered to be acceptable, to be uh, almost uh, fashionable. Uh, and there are a great number of papers uh, which have been published and so on, uh, and books uh, which have captured the imagination of many people, not only in the academic world, but beyond. And uh, of course, uh, the, uh, many people make references to inequalities uh, in, in explaining a whole variety of not only economic, but also social and political phenomena. Uh, and I'll come back to some of these uh, themes later. I think what uh, is uh, particularly important for me to emphasize at the outset is I will not be talking about, uh, I, when I use the word inequality, I'm referring to uh, relatively large populations and, and differences which are not, which don't involve uh, either uh, two groups, uh, for, uh, for example, men and women, uh, or uh, a few groups uh, like different age groups, uh, and I'm also not referring to, say, uh, uh, simply simple geographic groups uh, in the sense of, uh, let us say, Indonesia between, uh, let us say, Java and, uh, and some of the outer islands. Rather, I'm trying to speak to uh, other types of disparities. Uh, no, sorry, I'm not speaking to disparities. I would refer to those as disparities. Rather, I'm trying to speak to inequalities. But there are many types of inequalities too, and uh, I will focus largely on income inequalities. But it's very important to recognize that there are other inequalities, and it's very important for us to remember that uh, income inequalities or expenditure spending inequalities are not the end of the story. They, and uh, they, are, they are related in very complex ways to other types of inequalities, for example, the inequalities of wealth. Uh, and so let me try to, um, to uh, begin with a number of terms uh, which you will come across in the discussions of inequality. Uh, let, the first uh, um, is to familiarize you with something called the Lorentz curve. Okay? The Lorentz curve is basically a curve uh, which, dis which tries to capture uh, inequalities in a particular population. And uh, so if, let us say, there are two people in, uh, on an island, Robinson Crusoe and uh, Friday, okay? Uh, if Robinson Crusoe owns everything and Friday owns nothing, uh, you, you will have a line of absolute inequality, which would basically be um, this, this, and then up there, okay? This would be absolute inequality involving two people. Uh, if, however, uh, Robinson, uh, Robinson Crusoe decides to be magnanimous and shares everything uh, with Friday, you will have a line of absolute equality, which is this diagonal here. Okay? Now, in much larger populations, you often have inequalities uh, which uh, would be much, which would be distributed over populations. So, for example, this is line of inequality and this is another line of inequality. Now if you move from the inner line to the outer line, you basically it's an indication of increasing inequality. Okay? Um, and the Lorentz curve is, can, is actually a summation of, in, of small measures of inequality which are, which are known as Gini Coefficient. So, a Gini coefficient uh, of zero would be equivalent to this line. 
whereas a Gini coefficient of 1 would be equivalent to this line. So a Gini coefficient basically ranges from 0 to 1, and now increasingly many people talk in percentage terms. So you could have a Gini coefficient of 40% going up, so when inequality increases, it might go from 40%, let us say, to 50%, just to use a uh, uh, hypothetical example. Now, you, most of you cannot see, but this word, this says income inequality, and this says wealth inequality. In most of our societies, modern societies, you will find that wealth inequality measures are much higher than income inequality measures. And you will find, for example, that spending inequality, inequality in expenditure, uh, is often even less than income inequality. So, for example, for many years, until about a decade ago, Indonesian data, you could only get data on spending in Indonesia. You couldn't get income data for Indonesia. So, you, so when you compare spending in Indonesia with income, in other countries, you're actually comparing apples and oranges. They're not quite the same thing. So it's very important for us to understand uh, the nature of, of inequalities because the challenge for you is to try to convey all this to the public at large who would not be exposed to many of these uh, questions. Let me move on to tell you, uh, to complicate the story a little bit further. And basically, uh, instead, uh, of, of, of a line moving, let us say, from here to here, the black line, you could have uh, a line which would be like shaped like this, or you could have a line which is shaped like this. And all three lines could have the same Gini coefficient. Okay? Let us say the Gini coefficient is 40% or 0 0.4. Okay? You could have the same line but describe it is a summation of very different phenomena. Okay? So it is very important. So what you can capture in a Lorentz curve, you might not capture with a single measure of the Gini coefficient. Okay? I could, should also tell you that there's something else called the FEEL, T-H-E-I-L, index, which allows you to attribute overall inequality to various different factors. So you can say, for example, inequality, uh, part of it is due to, let us say, educational levels and so on and so forth, uh, and, and you can decompose. Uh, but that, that is very rarely used because it requires very good data and be the ability to do that kind of decomposition. Um, so that's important to remember that you can have one Gini coefficient capturing very, very different uh, phenomena, which you can better see uh, by using the Lorentz curve. Okay, let me move on very quickly. Another, um, uh, phenom uh, another term you often hear is something called the Kuznets curve. And the Kuznets curve is sometimes referred to as a bell curve, and sometimes it's referred to as an inverted U curve. Okay? And the term Kuznets curve is also used increasingly for all kinds of phenomena. For example, you might hear the term the environmental Kuznets curve. What, do the, what does it mean? It basically refers to, in this case, increasing inequality in the first period and then decreasing inequality in the second period. That's, that's basically what it says. So the environmental Kuznets curve basically is a term which is used to suggest not inequality anymore, but rather in worsening environmental situation in the early period, the early stage of development, for instance. And then as societies become wealthier and devote more resources to improving the environment, the environment, your, your, your deterioration of the environment will go down and therefore you have what is called an environmental uh, Kuznets curve. It has got nothing to do with inequality, it rather refers to the shape, the, the inverted U or the bell shape. Okay? So the next uh, slide basically is a slide which indicates to you uh, based what, is, what has happened over the last uh, millennium. Okay? 
Now, this is very heroic. Uh, there was a man who described himself as a cleometrician, Angus Madison, and he, who died about uh, uh, less than a decade ago. Angus Madison basically spent a lot of time putting together all kinds of data and trying to estimate retrospectively what trends you could make about the last 2,000 years, for instance. And so he has a book describing what he thinks has happened over the last 2,000 years. And this particular uh, uh, graph suggests it, it's a, his attempt to say two things here, yeah? or three things actually. So you have during the period from about 1,000 years ago to about 500 years ago. Okay, 500 years ago, the time of uh, Columbus or Magellan, etc., etc. Okay? During this period, inequality increases, but very slowly. And then, from about 500 years ago, it begins to go up slightly more. And then, from the, about two centuries ago, from the time of the Industrial Revolution, let us say, you have a big increase in inequality. Okay, here we're talking about world inequality. Okay, inequality at the world level. So you have, for example, because of the Industrial Revolution, higher productivity in, in the industrialized countries, accounting for some of this. And then you have here a drop. Now, why, why this drop? This drop basically begins, depending on the country, of course, from around the 1930s, sometimes after World War II. Why? Because largely it is attributed to a number of things, but largely due to labor struggles. Okay, so unions got together. In the case of the US, you often find uh, reference to the Philadelphia Declaration of 1920. Uh, for those who are otherwise in, uh, 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 inclined, they might refer to the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, or you know, um, some people would refer to Roosevelt in uh, his measures he, which he took from 1933, and so on and so forth. So you have a decline of inequality during this period, and then a reversal of that from around 1973. Okay, why 1973? For some people, including Madison, the most Im the important thing was the end of the era of the Bretton Woods system. Okay, so the Bretton Woods system was a was a basically new arrangements which were made from from 1944, where, where people like Keynes, a very famous English economist, was involved in negotiating with the Americans and others uh, in a place called Bretton Woods uh, in, in New Hampshire. And they agreed on the basis for the post-war order. And they developed a system called the Bretton Woods system to replace the previous system, which was sort of the gold standard. And the gold standard was replaced by effectively the dollar standard. But what happened was that during the 1960s, the Americans spent a lot of money, partly to finance the Vietnam War, and the re and when the, the and there was a euro dollar market. So the, the euro dollar market was such that that dollars were trading, and when the Ameri when the Europeans asked the Americans to produce gold, which was the ag agreement in 1944, one ounce of gold uh, was 35 was fixed at 35 U.S. dollars. Okay, so that when the when the Europeans said well, we're not so comfortable accepting only U.S. dollars, we want gold, the, Amer the Americans couldn't deliver, and so. Richard Nixon unilaterally ended that arrangement in 1971 and 1973 this was formalized and so for many people the sorry 1973 was the turning point. Let me go on again here you basically have from the time of the Industrial Revolution a gently increasing uh, inequality uh, as measured by the Gini uh, coefficient or Gini index here. Let me move on quickly. This is again another heroic attempt, last 2,000 years, okay? So you have, for example, Rome, the Byzantine Empire, various attempts by people using accounts of that period 
to try to estimate inequality. So this is really very crude, okay, an estimation using wealth inequality more than income inequality. So you have, you know, so-and-so uh, who had a lot of wealth, this was documented in Roman documents and so on and so forth. So you have Rome, Byzantine, and then Holland, Holland, the, the period of the Dutch Republic, subsequently uh, England, uh, Castile, uh, in, in uh, Castile from the time, especially important because of the of the Iberian uh, 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 division of, of the world between the Portuguese and the, and the Spanish, and then you have uh, Naples uh, and, and France. So these are different attempts. So you, you see, for example, uh, uh, different types. These are all uh, very rough estimates of uh, Gini coefficients. I just wanted to show this to you just to give you a sense of how differently people can talk about inequality. Okay? So this is another attempt uh, which is also very unusual. It's an attempt at a three-dimensional representation of inequality. And what do, we, what do you see here? You see an attempt to describe inequality at the global level. And what you have here on what, for those of you who don't remember your, your, your secondary school uh, uh, geometry, this is the x-axis, okay? So here you have the rich people on the left, the poor people on the right, okay? And then what you have on this unusual axis, okay? So the y-axis is here, this is the third axis, okay? This, so it's nicer if you had a three-dimensional thing and you, 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 have, uh, you, you, can, you can do this. What you have here is the poorer countries in front and the richer countries at the back, okay, on this axis. So basically, right here, you have the poor people from the poor countries. And way back there, you have the richer people in the richer countries. Okay, so this is an attempt at a three-dimensional representation of inequality looking at class, if you will, and at geography. Okay? Something which I will come back to later. So, uh, this basically is an, another way of telling, saying that global inequality actually is greater than national inequality. And, in other words, geography to, in today's world has become more important than class. Okay? It's a crude way of, of, of telling this story. Okay? So, and this is an, a way of sort of representing this. These are different regions of the world. And you can see that some, for some incomes have gone, oops, sorry. Incomes have gone up a lot. For some, incomes have hardly gone up. Okay? So as a result of that, you have huge disparities. Okay? Now, this is basically an attempt to look at the half, last half century and to show how different income groups have been doing. Okay? And basically, you can see that the increases in income have been quite, uh, have been higher for what you might crudely refer to as the middle class. Okay? The middle class here, from here to here. So for the richer elements, you don't see a huge increase in income and for the poorer, these are all 20%, 20%, okay, the, what I call in quintiles, okay. So for the bottom 20% as well, it, the increase in incomes are lower than for the middle 60%, okay. So th this again is a crude representation of that. I'm, I'm showing you different ways of representing, depending what kind of story you want to tell, you know, you can, these are all different techniques for telling that story. In this case, we are looking at the income of, the average income of countries, taking the poorest 20% of countries, and, uh, sorry, poorest 20 countries and the richest 20 countries. And what do you find? You find that on a per capita good basis, the poorest have increased over 40 years, yeah, from 1960 to the 
year 2000, the poorest have increased their incomes by about 25%. The richest have almost tripled their income, 300%. Okay? So you can see that from a geographical point of view, disparities have certainly increased. Okay? Now, this is an attempt by a Russian to tell the story of the 20th century. What, there's a famous historian named Eric Hobsbawm who talks about the short 20th century. So the short 20th century begins with the Russian Revolution, 1917, and ends with the end of the Soviet Union, 1991. Okay, so basically, for this representation, you see uh, the decline of inequality from around 1917, 1920, depending on what kind of story you want to tell, a decline of inequality until about 1980. What happens in 1980, around 1980? 1979, Mrs. Thatcher becomes Prime Minister. 1981, Ronald Reagan becomes President. Okay? And then you have a big change in economic policy. What some people refer to as the counter-revolution against Keynesian economics, against development economics. And then you can see that after an interregnum of about one decade, from around 1980 to 1990, you can see inequality going up again. Whichever measure you use, you find that inequality starts going up again. Okay? So this, again, is a different kind of story uh, you can tell using uh, in, in, uh, inequality, income inequality data. Well, this is a, uh, as you can see, uh, this, is, this is a particular joke for me about the, uh, Mrs. Thatcher used to, she said, oh, the French Revolution, you know, not important. The English, the glorious revolution, 1685, and then the Restoration, 1688, Charles I comes back. That is the, the, the great period. So, basically, the, the birth of Westminster, parliamentary democracy, etc., Cromwell, and so on. So, for, so, this is the period which for her is kind of important. So, you see for the UK, inequality going up. And then, coming down from the middle of the 19th century, Okay, for, for the UK. And then going up again from the time she takes over. Okay? And for the US, again, you have a very interesting story. And what is the US story? The US story, of course, is the story of the American Civil War. Okay? The end of slavery. Lincoln. And so on and so forth. So you, here you can see that if the Civil War's outcome was different, you might not have had this turning point. The Civil War's outcome, if the South had won, the Confederacy had won, slavery would have continued for uh, perhaps longer than it did. You know, because you remember that the, the last country, last major country to abolish slavery, uh, 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 Brazil, did so in 1888, okay, much after the US. Okay, so you, you have a different story. So you can see that with inequality data, you can tell many different stories depending on what data you choose to take and how you choose to spin it. Okay? Now, um, this is a, yet another way of, of presenting this similar data, but notice that the x-axis are not equal, equi uh, e you know, not quite equidistant. Yeah? Let me go on. Okay, this is a different type of story. This is a story of looking at the richest man in a society. Yeah? Unfortunately, they were not women. Yeah? The richest man in the society in relation to the average income of society. Now, for those of you at the back, who do you think has been the richest man in relation to his society? 
the richest ever. Who do you think? Those in the front row can see the name. So those, those at the back, can you guess? You think it was Rockefeller? You think it was Bill Gates? It was a man whose name you probably don't even remember, Mikhail Khodorovsky. Okay? Because you see, after the Russian, after the Russian counter-revolution, okay, Boris Yeltsin succeeded in reducing the national income of Russia by half. Okay? But a small group of so-called oligarchs became extremely rich and Khodorovsky was very, very important and he, won, he developed political ambitions. So Khodorovsky is way up here, 250,000 times. 250,000 times the average income of the Russians. I remember a professor from Moscow coming to, to me in the University of Malaya at that time, asking me for a job. And he, his income at that time, monthly income for a professor was six US dollars. Okay? And he wanted to just be a research assistant, if possible. He was a professor of literature, but he said, I'll do anything. You know? So that gives you a sense of how serious that collapse was and how this unequal it was. Another indication was the fact that male life expectancy in Russia fell by six years. In modern history, and by modern I'm talking about the last 6,000 years, there, is nev there has never been su in such a, a period where male life expectancy has dropped by as much. I mean, of course, leaving aside war, okay? Leaving aside war, you've never had such a situation before. So that gives you a sense of why, if you were trying to understand why, why is Putin popular, okay? You, when you begin to put it in this larger perspective, then you begin to understand that Putin represented an end to some many of these things which were happening. Okay, just for those who cannot see, the number two in this uh, in these tables is Rockefeller, at about one hundred and twenty thousand times. Bill Gates here is about seventy five thousand times. Carney, Andrew Carnegie is slightly under 50,000 times. And in ancient Rome, a man named Crassus was about, um, about, about uh, 30,000 times. Okay. So you can see, you can get a sense of the great inequalities which, have, which can prevail, sometimes episodically. You know, you have a, a major episode like the end of the Russian Revolution, I mean the Russian Revolution, and then you have, in this case, the counter-revolution, and this is the outcome of it. Okay, now, two years ago, the price of oil fell. Okay? And this is something which has been happening. Maybe people in Singapore don't feel it, but for many countries, developing countries, they are primary commodity exporters. And primary com the price of primary commodities vis-a-vis -vis other goods has basically declined over the course of the 20th century. Okay? If you look, you will find it is not a straightforward decline. It's going up and down, up and down, but the, this has continued. Now at the beginning of the 21st century, it went up until 2014, and now it has collapsed again. And this has a tremendous bearing on, for example, farmer incomes. Okay? Now, if you look carefully at the primary commodity prices, the big increases are usually due to minerals. Okay? And for minerals, many minerals, not many workers spend, they are involved especially the most expensive minerals. Okay? But 
for agricultural prices, hundreds of millions of people are involved. So it does make a difference if the price of whatever people are growing collapses. Okay? So this is very important to, to, to contextualize everything else you're talking about. Now, this is a, something which gives you an indication that manufactured goods prices also decline. In the past, people used to say, oh, the prices of primary commodities goes down, but the prices of manufactured goods go up. But what has happened with globalization, with more and more developing countries becoming involved in producing manufactured goods, we find that the prices have come down. You know this, what, when you buy a computer, a, a, a laptop, or, or any of the other I, uh, ICT products, you can experience it firsthand. Prices do come down. And this is very important for us to remember because in some countries, for example, the United States, it's not just that prices come down. Prices come down because they are now manufacturing abroad in countries Southeast Asian countries, or uh, in China, or where, wherever else. But the story is more complicated, of course. Americans are also losing their jobs. Or Americans are stuck in jobs, which have very little prospect of providing an, an income increase. So if you want to understand the, the phenomenon I was describing earlier, where geography counts, if geography counts so much, and I'll come back to this a little bit again later, then there will continue to be an urge for people to move because the differences in income are not because, simply because of productivity differences. They're also due to where you are. A friend of mine has thought, said that you have a citizenship dividend, but it's not a question of citizenship. You know, somebody from Bangladesh who works in Malaysia, his income is higher. He may be subjected to the worst conditions of workers in Malaysia, but relative to what he may earn in Bangladesh, he may be slightly better off. So this desire to move is a very, very strong desire. Okay? And so you will have many people, for example, insisting that they are refugees, economic refugees very often. You know? So what we see happening in the US and, the, and in Europe is a defensive rearguard action by people who see their con living conditions going down and it is easy to blame the other, the foreigner. So this is basically what is going on. So this is very fundamental to our understanding of what's going on in the world. Now, two other factors which are very important, not only in Africa but also in Asia, is what are called illicit financial flows. Because what we have seen over the last 30, 40 years is increasing financial liberalization. Money is being encouraged to cross borders. Okay? To, we are, can, can, governments are being told to facilitate the ease of flows. And long ago, now nobody believes this, long ago there was a so-called economic theory that there was that money, that, that funds would flow from the capital rich countries, presume them to be the rich countries, to the capital poor countries. So the policy implication is open up your countries, the funds will flow in. Now there was a, a Malaysian economist who used to live in Singapore and he, he wrote a book while he was uh, here in Singapore in Changi prison, published in 1960. And he said, hoping for, a bet, for this to happen, is like opening a bird cage and expecting more birds to fly in than to fly out. Okay? So, what are the two factors which are responsible for many of these flows? One is what is called trade mispricing. 
or misinvoicing to be more accurate. What the data which is presented by firms, importers and exporters to the customs authorities and the other authorities are not quite accurate, let me put it there, politely. And the second factor, of course, is that people are moving their money to evade tax or to minimize their tax exposure. And this is a huge problem. Okay? Some developing countries, particularly in uh, the Caribbean, have said, well, well, let's try to make money by beating them at this game. Okay? And there are many countries now, Switzerland, for example, is no longer the number one place for where, this, where such money goes. Okay? So you have all kinds of motivations, but the result is, as the former president of South Africa, Tabu Mbeki, presented last year in a major report, illicit financial flows from Africa. Yeah, you remember the famous book, Out of Africa? Illicit financial flows from Africa greatly exceed foreign aid, foreign investment. Okay? So basically, foreign aid and foreign investment do not even compensate for what is leaving Africa. Yeah, this is the, the tragedy. And I would say that this is also true of many other countries. But I want to give, illustrate this point further by using an example of, let us take two dictatorships. Okay? Two dictatorships where one dictatorship grows at 3% and the other at 8%. These are real examples I'm giving you. You can guess which, which, which dictatorships I'm talking about. One is growing at 3%, one is growing at 8%. I'm talking about Southeast Asia now. Island republics. Okay? <laughs> now, how do you explain the difference? Why is, it, why is this one growing at 3% and one growing at 8% for a couple of decades? The, real, the main reason is that the 3% the people who are making all that money took the money out to Hong Kong, Singapore, Honolulu, etc. The 8% they reinvested in the country. To make themselves richer, of course, they weren't doing it because they loved the country so much, but to make themselves even richer because they already had the privilege, privileges associated with it, being a dictator. So they control all the toll roads, etc. etc. But the result of it, the toll roads got built. Whereas in the case, the first case, nothing was, nothing much was built. So this, so you can have gross inequalities with different outcomes. Okay. Now, one of the other ways in which people look at income distribution is by looking at. If, for those of you who remember your your undergraduate economics or A-level economics, you remember that there's something called returns to capital and returns to labor. Okay? So salaries are all considered returns to labor. And um, other things are considered returns to capital. But we have a new phenomenon now that in the financial sector, many payments are considered salaries. Okay? A CEO paying themselves 10 million a year, but is paid as a salary. Okay? So what, what does that imply? So it is recorded as a income in terms of as an income to labor. But here what this shows is that you can have huge disparities in incomes, especially in the financial sector. So you can, so what you have seen in the recent period, from around 1990, a huge increase in disparities, excess incomes as a multiple of average. Okay. So, just because it is said to be an uh, uh, income for labour doesn't mean that it goes to the bank clerk or anybody like that. Okay. This is something which 
tells you how the world has changed. In the last few years, I, I'll tell you a story. 11, 12, uh, 11 and a half years ago, I joined the United Nations and I paid a courtesy call to Washington. And I went to see my, my counterpart at the State Department and introduced myself and so on and so forth. And he went on to, uh, he started ranting about how the, uh, how the UN was terrible, you know, because I, I, he asked me what I was doing. I said, I'm preparing this report on, on what was happening with women throughout the world, which, which we produce every five years. And then I was preparing another report on income inequality. And then he said, the problem with the United Nations is that you're promoting class warfare. Okay? So I just kept quiet and listened to him and polite. After that, I left. But today, everybody is talking about inequality. And part of the reason is because there is a recognition that there is something fundamentally wrong and that inequality is contributing to the problems which we have in the world economy. Because you cannot grow the world economy if no, you can, you can produce a lot of stuff, but if there is no demand, what economists call aggregate demand, then nobody is going to buy that stuff. So you need aggregate demand. That's why excessive inequality is not desirable. And so you will find that there are the research department of the IMF, for example, which is the source of some of this, this, this particular graph, which is basically showing that the greater, the greater the inequality, the lower the growth is likely to be. Okay? So you, you find an institution which was considered always very conservative, always defensive about inequality in the past, forced now to acknowledge. Now the, the battle is not over. These issues are issues which are always the sub subject of ongoing policy debate. And you will find that in all our societies, there are people who continue to defend inequalities. Inequalities are desirable. I've, I still heard, I still hear, uh, just last week I heard somebody say, well, you know, if you give money to poor people, they will spend it all. You give it to rich people, they will invest it. How is the economy going to grow if you don't invest? So give it to the rich. Let rich people get richer because they are going to invest. Poor people are not going to invest because they are living, you know, uh, at, at the and on the margin. So you will find these arguments constantly being presented, usually much more elegantly. I've been very crude in presenting the argument, but they will be presented much more elegantly, and everybody will claim their evidence is all there behind them. So you as journalists have to have to be have to be prepared to ask difficult questions of the people you are you're working with. Now this is the, uh, I think this is the last uh, uh, chart of, uh, of the slideshow. This is called the elephant chart. And it's attributed to a friend of mine named Branko Milanovic, who has published three books. I must say that not many economists know how to write for the ordinary person. Paul Krugman is one who is quite successful in terms of being quite accessible. And Branko's books, although they, they, are, they are books and, and not many people like to read books these days, Branko's books are very accessible. And uh, so do, do think about it. But, but more importantly, Branko is telling us a story which is quite complex. So this is basically income distribution. You know, from, from, and basically what he's showing is that there has been very little income increase for the bottom 10% of the world's population. Very little income increase. And then, so for other sectors, for other segments of the population, you have a greater increase. And then, very interestingly enough, 
from around 60 to about 75 percent, you find that income, the income increase is much, much less. So he's, what he's basically saying for, for these people, and even for, especially for these people, you have seen over, the, over an extended period of time, basically 20 years, some people experiencing a decline in their income, and others experiencing very low increase in their, increases in their income. Okay? Now, the shape of this is very much like the shape of an elephant with the trunk up. Okay? So it's often referred to as the elephant curve. Okay? And when, it, when he first presented it, uh, it, it caught, captured the imagination, so you might come across this. Now, Milanovic is one of the few people who has actually looked at income distribution at the global level. Most people, when they're talking, when they talk about income distribution, they're talking about income distribution within a particular society. So Thomas Piketty, for example, is talking about income distribution within what are called the OECD economies, basically Western Europe, Japan, Australia, and of course the United States. States. Okay. So Milanovic is basically looking at the overall picture and he is the one who has basically shown in his earlier books that geography accounts for anywhere between, somewhere between 65 to 70 percent of overall inequality. Okay. And this is why this challenge of the desire for migration if it is, is will, will, will be with us, you know. It's not a question simply of the war in, in uh, Libya or the war in Syria, as deplorable as those might be. There are other reasons why there is a great desire for people to move, because they don't see any hope of improving their living conditions where they are. Okay. So you will find I've, I've met, for example, people with master's degrees from, from, from India or Bangladesh who are work prepared to work, do menial labor to improve because they, they feel that they, they, are, they are better off doing that, that work. So this is the kind of, these are some of the challenges which you will face. Uh, I've tried to introduce as many ways of presenting inequality as, as possible. Uh, there are, this is not exhaustive, I can assure you, there will be other ways of presenting inequality. I've also used these different ways to try to give you a sense of how history matters, how things have changed over time. And I've also made the point that geography matters. So you can see that in many ways, as a non-specialist, as a generalist, you are not as handicapped as you might think you are, okay? Because very often economists are so narrow in their focus that they have one hypothesis and they pursue that hypothesis and they lose sight of the possibility that there might be multiple explanations for the phenomenon in which we are living in. So I think that this might be an appropriate point for, for me to stop and perhaps we could have a little bit of a discussion and, uh, and continue from here. Thank you very much for your time. Some of these explanations are certainly uh, external to do with uh, really global factors that are really beyond your own society's control. But I was also struck by uh, the importance of um, uh, explanations that are that purely domestic. I mean, it's amazing to see what a, an impact uh, a president's or a prime minister's policies can have. Um, that uh, it could actually really be a tipping point for certain trends or a revolution or world movement and so on uh, actually have very strong quantifiable effects. And, uh, then uh, the other uh, kind of factor that you alluded to was um, I suppose more, I don't know how to describe it, more almost intellectual fashion or maybe some moral consciousness 
uh, I guess the the uh, would it be right to say that now at least in terms of the moral advance that human beings have made, we find inequality more acceptable than humans did um, uh, 500, 1,000 years ago. It's something more acceptable, more uh, something that we need to address than perhaps people who are willing to live with it in the past. Uh, so there are these mix of factors, and I wonder if you've seen uh, in the, the news media that you read uh, errors being made by sort of misattributing inequality when uh, a country's situation uh, really has to do more with external factors. Uh, journalists are busy blaming their own politicians who may be quite helpless uh, in the face of it. Or conversely, uh, uh, thinking that the enemy is out there when in fact it boils down to uh, just bad politicians. That's a very tough question uh, because one cannot really generalize for many different types of societies. Um, and I think one can paint uh, broad strokes, but it's very difficult to, to, to be very much more precise. Um, you know, the drop in primary commodity prices uh, affects those who are dependent on the export of primary commodities, or more dependent on primary, export of primary commodities than those who are less dependent on the export of primary commodities. But then there are primary commodities and primary commodities. Uh, some primary commodities uh, may be affected by a general trend. Some primary commodities may also be subjected to uh, declining uh, demand for, uh, let me give you two examples. Copper, uh, in the old days, uh, when you had uh, conventional telephones, copper was the essential ingredient for the extension of, of telecommunications. Uh, today, copper is hardly uh, used for that. So the price of copper uh, dropped uh, very significantly uh, uh, in, in, in early, in, at the end of the 20th century and has never really recovered. Uh, but there are other commodities uh, which previously were not valued very much, uh, say rare earth, uh, uh, products which are very important for modern ICT uh, which are very much in demand. So again you can the, the story has to be nuanced. Um, I generally think that um, it is it is possible for, for governments to do things to mitigate. You cannot uh, you don't want to cut your nose to spite your face, right? But there are ways in which you can try to mitigate the effects if you have the correct uh, policy framework. Uh, but very often, very often, it's very difficult to develop that kind of, that kind of policy framework. Um, but governments um, are also capable of learning. And this is where journalism becomes extremely important because when you when you uh, inform you are there's an implicit analysis in how you in, in whatever you inform your public about your readership about and that has a tremendous influence in public discourse in public understanding of things and that public understanding of things impinges on policy makers as well. So policy, I've seen in some societies, policy makers who have been trained to believe certain things. Uh, and then um, they are rudely awakened by the actual experience of what is happening. So today, for example, uh, you find that many uh, African policy makers don't simply buy the discourse which they previously bought into, the discourse from, from, from the West, whether it, it is from the UK or the US or France, because France is very, very influential, especially in Francophone countries. And uh, um, for example, uh, about 
three, four weeks ago, I was in Nairobi uh, with a bunch of uh, African, uh, West African, uh, Francophone uh, 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 policymakers, senior policymakers, ministers, and so on. And uh, it was interesting that once they felt free to talk, they all talked about how they were in this golden cage called the CFA, the com the, which is the CFA is uh, basically tied to the euro. Okay, and they and basically the, the room, the room which they had for independent monetary policy and or, or fiscal policy was constrained by being in this golden cage. I have not. You know, I, I worked in the UN for 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 uh, UN system for 11 years, and I've been working in Africa f uh, for for more than two decades. I've never seen people so emboldened. So you 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 do feel that uh, uh, that there there is hope, um, and you often you also now have a public which is increasingly skeptical of their leadership. Um, you know, um, sometimes the, the almost you find increasingly that uh, people have become so cynical that they, when you ask them why this policy uh, is being pursued, uh, they often do not hesitate if they feel free to speak, uh, to say, look at the best interests of those in charge. You know, so you, you, you know, so you, you find that discourses are changing, but discourses are changing be partly because you have increasingly bold editors and gen journalists uh, in many of these societies, and so um, I think I think it is extremely important. I, I I find that print journalism in particular has greater potential because. Very often with uh, broadcast journalism, there is a great deal of pressure to be uh, to be sh very short-termist. You know, what's your view on what happened? What's if you know? You don't have a chance to 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 go into depth, to give a lo longer longer-term perspective, uh, and to fill out the details. So this is. Uh, but I've also seen situations where. Uh, uh, you you have uh, longer interviews, um, uh, which uh, which can be quite insightful and so on. But unfortunately, very often you don't have such a, a, a large uh, audience for these uh, more more difficult interviews. So it's a bit of a trade-off uh, as well. So thanks for your uh, very informative speech. Uh, I'm a general from China. So my question is, uh, how do you... Ah? Yeah, I'm, I'm a general from China. Uh, no. <laughs> so my question is, uh, how do you think of the current uh, anti-globalization uh, wave? Because now you see in the US, both the presidential can candidates are against the TTP, and also in EU, both the leadership are against the TTIP, and also the Brexit also happened two months ago. The main, uh, the main reason the, uh, this leadership uh, mentioned is that because the globalization have created inequalities in, in these countries because of the, maybe the manufacturing industry have moved to China. So how do you think of this uh, source right now? Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Leon from uh, Marua, uh, human rights NGO in Singapore. Uh, increasingly, uh, there has been more discussion, debate on the issue that the inequality in Singapore, we have one of the highest genies in the world, is the outcome of a unique development model whereby from a cash flow perspective, the government essentially doesn't spend a single cent on healthcare, pensions or public housing. What is your view on this? Thank you. I think, uh, let me try to respond to your sec your, your, the second question first. Um, I, I don't know enough about Singapore, and I, I don't want to comment too much about uh, about Singapore. Uh, but uh, I think uh, the the impression most people have is that Singapore has actually uh, achieved quite a bit, particularly in the 
public housing arena. So many, very often you find that, uh, that other countries are often encouraged to, to look at Singapore in terms of public housing. The fact that it, they, they don't actually spend any money, but rather it is the, uh, the, the homeowners, the eventual homeowners who, who do the spending. Uh, so the question then becomes is how they have they structured it uh, to, to achieve this result. So I think there are still lessons, but as far as the inequalities uh, are concerned, um, I think Singapore has a situation which is very, uh, uh, in a, it's, it's similar but different from Mal the Malaysian situation. The, the, the reason in Malaysia, we almost one third, I think about one third of the labor force is foreign. And of the, of the foreign work, workers, uh, only a third of the foreign workers are properly documented, okay, in the sense that they are in the country legally, etc. Two thirds are not. And Malaysia continues to uh, benefit a great deal from agricultural exports. So, uh, and if you don't include the foreign workers in any narrative about Malaysia, you're missing a great deal. Now in Singapore, you have foreign workers, in the past the foreign workers were at the lower end, and you still have foreign workers at the lower end of the, of the labor force, but you also have now a great number of foreign workers at the, high, at the higher end. And uh, I'm, I've not seen any uh, analysis of what the implications of all that uh, are. Uh, but I suspect that that uh, this is part of the story. Now, I've, I've seen I, uh, a couple of studies of, of why Singaporeans emigrate. And uh, the reasons are not necessarily very economic reasons. It's much more complicated than that. Uh, one of the very interesting phenomena which is coming out of the, of the Western debate is the huge increase in financial debt, in, in household and personal debt. So people are now much more indebted in many of our societies, in Singapore included, in terms of housing loans, in terms of car loans, and so on and so forth. Housing loans is usually the biggest item. And um, so when you look at in at inequality, do we does in, is income the, the end of the story? Do we start looking, for example, at disposable income after you pay off all the various things you have to pay off? So these are all very interesting questions about income inequality, but my impression is that even on the straightforward question of income inequality, there has been uh, a significant increase. But the fact that Singapore is a global player and a regional player also implies that at the upper end, the top end, you are not, the official data is unlikely to capture that because a lot of it, a lot of income as well as wealth is held overseas. People who have properties in Australia, in the UK, etc., etc., you know, how does that enter into your national data? But it's part of the of the of the of the income distribution or the wealth distribution uh, in this country. Uh, if I may, because we're running out of time, let me move uh, quickly back to to uh, to uh, a question from our Chinese colleague. I think one of the big uh, one of the big challenges uh, in 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 the in the West now is that you have. Uh, a situation, uh, especially in Europe, um, where uh, the the finance ministers, the governments, have become captive of their own ideology, the ideology of fiscal consolidation, of fiscal austerity. Okay. So what we find is that the IMF. Even the IMF, is very, which is dominated by the Europeans, is very pessimistic about the prospects for economic recovery in Europe. So if you rely 
on the US or on China to be the locomotive for the world economy. You're basically heavily reliant on, uh, you know, you're not, you're not optimizing what is available. Okay? And this is part of the problem. So, um, so I, I'm very worried, frankly, because what you have in Europe is an unwillingness to adopt serious growth, policy, growth policies, a myth that the problem is that the workers are, ask, are demanding too much. So you have policies to liberalize labor markets, and that will put downward pressure because you have high unemployment. You put down further downward pressure on incomes. You will in further increase inequalities. Okay, and you won't have much growth. Okay, everybody in the world wanted to recover from the 2008 crisis by exporting. That's impossible. You can't all be exporting. Who's going to import? Right? So, you know, we have a lot of fallacies which even the most ordinary person who has never opened an economic book in their, in their lives can tell you it just doesn't make sense. Right? But, nonetheless, finance ministers and other economic ministers can tell you this with a straight face. Of course, they won't put it as crudely as I put it. They will dress it up in some kind of fancy economic jargon. But the message is essentially the same. Okay? Now, you have a situation in the US where you've had some stronger recovery compared to Europe. But it's a very fragile recovery and it's a recovery which has actually restored the incomes of the richest people in the US. For ordinary people, they've got more, they more there's, there's less unemployment now, undoubtedly, compared with 2009. Much, much less unemployment. But you do not have the prospect of better jobs. And this is part of the problem. So you have a crisis of what um, some Europeans would call liberal market economies as opposed to coordinated market economies, which is what the, oh, the European model used to be. It's no longer the case, but it used to be that. So you have a situation where, unfortunately, we are now all stuck in this golden cage. The golden cage which has been created by the European finance ministers, and it's of course complicated by the fact that they are all part of the Eurozone, and hence subjected to German Dutch discipline. Okay? So you have a, that straight jacket imposed on the rest of Europe. You know? And you, know, you, you can feel every now and then that they are struggling to get out of it. France might make a, a squeak here. Uh, Greece, of course, made more than one squeak there. And, and, and the uh, Matteo Renzi in Italy has, has you know, complained. But you, there, there, is, there, there doesn't seem to be a solution while keeping the Eurozone. And this is a problem. The, for those of you who are interested, uh, uh, Joseph Stiglitz has come out with this book on, on Europe, which, which goes into this in, in great detail. But we are all now stuck with that. Africa more so than, than, than the rest of the world. But all of us are affected. You know, if, the, if a major engine is not going to play its role, then we are all stuck. So I, I'm very uh, uh, worried. Now, then you have the US-China tensions, which are not helping at all. Because, you know, President Obama uh, makes his, state of, his last State of the Union message. He says that the most important thing for him in this last year is the TPP, okay? And I've spent much of the last eight months looking closely at the TPP and it really doesn't offer very much. And it has a lot of dangers. The two biggest dangers are the likelihood of significant increases in medic 
prices of medicine. Okay? And this is something all of you journalists should be very interested in. Because I don't know whether you followed the case of Martin Shkreli. Martin Shkreli was a man who bought over a company and he increased the price of the drugs that company was selling from 1250 to 750 a 60 fold increase okay 6000 6, percent increase of the price of that drug okay he justified it as necessary to to fund research okay and Loretta Lynch, the U.S. Attorney General, knew that public sentiment was outraged, wanted to do something, but she could not find anything to prosecute him with because there is no law against price gouging in the United States. So what did she do? She finally has prosecuted him for running a Ponzi scheme. Okay? Because the law does not, does not disallow what Martin Screlly has done. And now, with the TPP, we will all be subjected to that law and the inadequacies of the system. So they can pri anybody can price gouge. Okay? Once you have a monopoly, and that monopoly is going to be extended now to cover many things, for example, naturally occurring things, insulin. Okay? I don't know how many of you are diabetic, but Malaysia is number one for diabetes in, 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 in Asia now. If you, you need insulin. Insulin occurs naturally in animals. It's extracted from the animals, given to, the, given to humans. Now it can be, can be subjected to intellectual property rights, which will base, an intellectual property right is basically a right to a monopoly. Okay? So you can imagine that there is going to be a, a big in, an increase of prices for all kinds of goods, especially in the pharmaceutical area. Okay? Even textbooks will be subjected to, to inter, the higher prices and so on. But let's focus on the pharmaceutical. And what are we going to do? The 11 other countries in the, in, in the TPP are willingly signing up for this. And then you have a situation of the Investor State Dispute Settlement Scheme where a private company can sue a government if they can claim that that government has deprived it of making a ch the opportunity to make more money. So, I'll give you an example. In Malaysia, the number one herbicide has been known to be carcinogenic for over a decade. If the Malaysian government was to ban the use of that herbicide, the Malaysian government could be subjected to a lawsuit which it is likely to lose from that company to compensate them for the loss of profits. You all saw this with the suit on tobacco. Okay? But the Australian Supreme Court basically killed it. But that, and tobacco is now carved out. But in other areas, there's nothing. So, in the past, the principle has been, if there's a polluter, the polluter pays. Okay? Now, we pay people not to kill us. Okay? I mean, that's the ultimate, that's the ultimate, uh, you know, I, yeah. So we, we, we have, and this, all this will be enabled. This will be the new law of our land. In Malaysia, we are changing more than 30 laws in order to advance foreign corporate interests. Many things which are not in our interest are going to be basically part of this whole story. So this is, and that's why if China wants to promote the RCEP as an alternative, it should not try to compete with the TPP in the areas which are most onerous, which is what the Japanese and some Korean companies are proposing, have even stronger intellectual property rights and so on.
This is not the way to proceed. So that's why I think what the Indian government has done recently, which is to propose a different model investment act, uh, sorry, investment treaty, is probably something which all of us should learn about. All of us stand to benefit. Brazil has done something similar as well. You know, and of course we all cannot, every country cannot go and reinvent the wheel, but there's so, so much we can learn by familiarizing ourselves with the Indian uh, the model, the Brazilian model, and so on and so forth. So there is so much which you can do, really. There's so much we can do to facilitate learning, you know, and this is why I, I particularly appreciate the, this opportunity to come here to talk, talk to you and, and share some thoughts. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you.